Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for being here today with us and for this beautiful invitation, which honors me very much. So I'm going to share my screen with you in order to show you a series of excerpts and stills um, related to my work. I'm going to show you a small excerpt from the film Journey to a Land Otherwise Known. Les hommes et les femmes de ce pays sont aussi bien faits que ceux du nôtre. Seulement le soleil leur a donné une teinte brune. Ils vont absolument nus et ne se cachent pas les parties intimes. Ils n'ont pas de barbe car ils se l'arrachent avec soin. Ils se parent aussi avec des plumes. Avant de passer outre, je crois devoir dire un mot du génie et du caractère de ces sauvages. Journey to a Land Otherwise Known is part of a series around exoticism that I started in 2009. The series was related to my own experience as a Colombian immigrant and the difficulty to feel integrated in France. It was rooted in post-colonial and decolonial thinking, the construction of a foreign other as theorized by Edouard Said and complex identities and mestizajes. I started working in places representing a tropical elsewhere, intrinsically linked to the history of colonialism, tropical greenhouses and botanical gardens. In these sites, the plants coming from European colonies were analyzed and studied in order to understand and control the colonies' ecosystems. So these places also became attraction sites during the colonial exhibitions and even became sites for the so-called ethnological exhibitions, later known as the human zoos. The building that you see here, in which the film was shot, is the equatorial greenhouse belonging to the Botanical Garden of Lille, a city in the north of France. It was built in the 70s by the architect Jean-Pierre Sec, and its brutalist style actualizes the so-called crystal palace, the classic greenhouse style. I wanted in this film to unearth the colonial past embedded in this site, and I decided to associate colonial text from the conquest of America with this place. During my research, I realized how similar European travelers' accounts were even when written over very different times. The same archetypes and stereotypes came back incessantly, as if this narrative were, the perpet were perpetuating ideology of the European mor moral cultural superiority. I was very compelled by these colonial fictions, and I wanted to do a satire about their echoes with the present political moment. So the film is a pastiche of a visual anthropology account with a male voiceover explaining the, the arrival to the so-called new world. His description is contradicted by uh, the enclosed garden that we see in the images, and his attempts to classify and explain this nature are sabotaged by masked figures 
who carnivalize and highlight the surrealism and the absurdity of this text. The film is divided into chapters, mimetizing the form of the colonial traveler's account, and the script was inspired by a number of canonical colonial texts. A bridged narrative of travels descending the river of Amazons by Charles de la Condamine, true story and description of a country of wild, naked, grim, man-eating people in the New World America by Hans Staden, the true history of the conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz del Castillo, history of a voyage to the land of Brazil, otherwise called America by Jean de Lery, and the Ipiapaba mission by Father Antonio Vieira. The film ends with a ritualistic scene. A camouflage character washes themselves with a chunk of ice, revealing a queer character whose identity is complexified. This uncanny scene is a poetic evocation of the colonial roots of modernity in the Americas, with the ice block referred to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. Uh, the first scene of the book, when the narrator describes the arrival of ice to the Colombian desert as a metaphor for the arrival of industrialization. For some researchers, the Anthropocene begins with the arrival of U Europeans to America, and the film poetically evokes that as well. I would like to show you a small excerpt of another uh, film called Ecuador. The excerpt is about two minutes long. So this film, Ecuador, is a journey upstream the Amazon River where modernist constructions have been abandoned like the memories of an engulfed civilization of the future. Ecuador is a science fiction documentary evoking the colonization of nature, former utopias in Latin American forest and their cohabitation with the present. For this film, I invented a number of utopian brutalist architectures inspired by real buildings um, of the former USSR. Ecuador was conceived as an inverted diptych for a journey to a land otherwise known. Instead of staging a fake jungle in a real architecture, I decided to insert fake architectures in the real Amazonian forest. This fiction was a way to speak about the inadequacy of the modernist models of progress that were imported by the political American elites. How these models reiterate a lack of engagement with the tropical forest, a lack of adaptability and sustainability. A very important element of the film was to represent the Amazon's inhabitants' daily life as being detached from those models coming from foreign utopias and excesses. So the architectures were not supposed to be realistic, but rather fantastic. And the film presents a parallel present, an alternate history. So alternative histories are a genre, genre of speculative fiction consisting of stories in which one or more historical events occur differently. 
So in my film, uh, the film imagines a past when a violent political dictatorship imposes a certain way of living together through these architectures. But in the fictitious, in the fictitious present that the film evokes, the local people keep on doing their activities, ignoring the political willingness of control. Ecuador also presents moments of the Amazonian landscape intertwined with the science fiction aspect of the project. Um, I wanted to give space and representation to the Amazonian lands as subjects on its own, not necessarily subjected to human time, but having its own cycles. So in the final scene of the film, where this image comes from, we see an agricultural field called La Chagra, you can see the plants here, under the Amazon's river flood, which occurs during the rain season. This is an element that is more and more present in my work, how nature becomes a character rather, rather than a setting, and how it is a subject not defined by human time. I would like to briefly introduce the film that we are going to see, uh, The Labyrinth. The film is part of a series of works that I did around the notion of ethnographic fiction that I developed between 2012 and 2018. The paradox at the core of this series is that ethnography as an ensemble of narratives very rooted in colonialism could be considered as a form of fiction making. While some of the most interesting attempts at contemporary decolonial practices of ethnography so my ethnographic fiction series reflect upon those ambiguities and complexities inherent, inherent to anthropological practices while building cinematic spaces on their own. So the labyrinth revolves around a drug lord villa in the Colombian Amazon, a villa that was built imitating the mansion appearing in the soap opera dynasty. The film evokes the arrival of drug trafficking to Leticia in the south of in the south of the Colombian Amazon. The narrator of this film, Cristobal Gomez, is a longtime collaborator and he also appears in Ecuador. So the labyrinth intertwines his testimony of his experiences being at the same time a worker for drug lords and a member of an indigenous community deeply affected by the arrival of drug trafficking in the Amazon. So Cristóbal stands in between several worlds, and the film also conveys this sense of duality. And the film shifts in its own structures, because it starts as a historic account and ends with, narr with the narrator telling a near-death experience, the most subjective experience one can have, since nobody witnesses what we see during these moments. The film also draws a parallel between oil extractivism, drug trafficking violence, and ecological warfare. And I would like to stop here, not to tell you more, because we are going to watch the film after a series of questions coming from the audience. And I had a question about the sound. So how do you choose the sound uh, feature in your films? And how do you combine these sounds to the images? Yeah, so in these films, um, the sound has a very important um, space in the film. I, I, for me, um, cinema is, a, is in, it's an experience that is audiovisual, so sound is as important as the image for me. And most of the time I try to also um, bring a reflection upon what kind of sounds I am using. So for example, in Journey to a Land Otherwise Known, since it was a film that had a strong connection with historical archives, I almost all the sounds that we hear in the film are sounds coming from archives as well. They are sounds from, very, from different forests across the globe, um, a little bit like the plants that we see in the image, which comes from very different places. But in Ecuador, for example, I decided to use only um, sound recordings, field recordings that I did by myself in the Colombian Amazon. And this is something also present in the labyrinth. Most of the sounds doesn't, don't come from uh, archives, um, but come really from my field recordings. And so every single, I would say that each film has a sort of tapestry with 
uh, different layers of sounds with music and uh, and every time in every single project the sound takes a, a really huge part of it it's very specific um what is the most memorable influence in your career that's a beautiful question i think that the person who has marked me the most is Cristobal Gomez, um, the person who appears in the labyrinth and my most um, recent films. Cristobal comes from the Muinamurui community in the Colombian Amazon. And thanks to him, I have had the great privilege and luck to be able to understand different uh, ways to relate with nature. And I have learned so much from his um, relation, more specifically from his relationship to the coca plant and how this plant is seen in his community as a sacred subjectivity, a, a, a person with who we can engage a dialogue uh, instead of seeing and perceiving plants as objects for consumption, really trying to engage with nature as um, an entity or a person with who we can uh, really negotiate and, and build and understand and learn from. So I think Cristobal Gomez has been the most uh, important influence in my work in the past years. Great, thank you so much. Um, I just see another question here in the chat. Um, could you take us through uh, the detailed process that you follow to do some of your films? Yes, I don't have um, a specific, I would say, methodology because I like to invent the methodology for each one of the films. There are some things that are very much present in each one of my projects. The intertwining between um, nonfiction and fiction. Most of the times I like to engage on um, long-term inquiries or research um, around one historical archive or one situation grounded on reality uh, linked to my own experience as a Colombian living in France and the relationship between Europe and the Americas, the colonial frictions and tensions. So I, I'm looking very closely to these real aspects. And then I try to, um, through experimentation and audiovisual creation, I try to invent forms of language um, in dialogue with the history of cinema and contemporary art, but also uh, languages that allow me to uh, build new spaces of communication and expression. So I am very much influenced by experimental cinema, by many different artists, yeah. and I think that my process is very connected as, uh, to the process of people doing films, um, but yes, art house films, I would say, and each one of my films is a very long process. The labyrinth that you will see, uh, this project, uh, I started this project in 2011 and the film premiered in 2018. So it was seven years in the making, coming back and forth, going to the Amazon and keeping the conversation with Cristobal alive, uh, creating images and sound, and then at the end of the process, trying to give shape to all this material together, put together. So this is something very important for me. I like to produce um, my films in a very slow, in a slow way of doing. Uh, I am not overproducing work, but uh, I am rather focusing on projects that are meaningful, deep, and 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 complex. So this is one of the things that unite the work. Um, maybe we can go, I could speak about this for a very long time, so maybe we can, um, I, I can try to answer other questions. Sure, um, yeah, so I can just see another question here. Um, how does your work relate to anthropology? Does it reverse it, allowing the subjects of the films to see themselves, i.e. reverse anthropology? Yes, so as I was briefly um, explaining, I have a critical dialogue and complex relationship with anthropology. Uh, when I started doing my films, uh, Journey to Ireland, otherwise known, for example, which was made in 2000, um, 2011, that film was in, in a critical dialogue against anthropology. It was almost an anti-ethnographic film 
because I was looking to these documents of the so-called first encounters between uh, Europeans and, and, and the native people of the Americas and looking at those documents with a very um, yes, critical look with a lot of, of disagreement on how the, the, the discipline was uh, founded and, and its relationship with, with the colonialism. And then I started doing a practice-based PhD around the idea of ethnographic fiction, very much related to Jean Rouge's work, I would say, because he, uh, as we know, he was a visual anthropologist who did films, and he used fiction in his own work in order to be able to include um, the persons in the film in a more active way and have a sense of a shared anthropology where where this, the subjects of the film are not only looked at, but they are also participating in the film. Uh, but when I started working around this idea of the ethnofictions, I realized that this intertwining between fiction and ethnography um, started before Jean Rouge and all, was also present in many different practices, not only in film or in cinema, but also uh, in other forms of artistic practices. And I real, realized as well at that moment that uh, contemporary anthropologists were thinking about similar questions of trying to decolonize the discipline and to have a critical look upon what the, how the discipline was founded and, 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 and its roots. And so I started thinking about um, this uh, integration of fiction in the, in the discipline. And I had the chance to be part of a laboratory for about three years, the Sensory Ethnography Lab, which is uh, based at Harvard University. And I realized there that indeed there was a strong link between my work and its immersive uh, research and, and, and research on site, which are very close to the anthropologist works. And that we had indeed similar questions in regards to uh, decolonization and, and this these uh, questions. So I have a strong connection with anthropology and I think it's also the, when we talk about decolonization it's important to say that it's a work in progress. I think that it's not uh, one single answer that you put uh, that you apply to one methodology but it's a series of gestures and reflections in order to advance and try to do th to produce uh, things otherwise. And so, as I said, the, for me, the conversation with Cristobal Gomez has been extremely important and has shaped a lot how my films are made and produced. And I think the next step is indeed to be able to uh, produce perhaps other ways of, of making the films where, um, where maybe there can be a sense of uh, collaboration that is expanded, which for now has not been possible because of the distance between myself living in France and them being in Colombia and with the coronavirus crisis today, it has been uh, more difficult than before to, to be connected. Have you lived in Amazon communities yourself? Um, Lothar Baumgarten is known to have lived in Amazon communities for a long time. Uh, do you know his work? And if yes, what is the aspect of his work that you like the most? Yes. So I haven't lived in Amazon communities myself. I have been, as I said, um, doing uh, field work there, which means that I, for since 2011, I have been staying for very long periods of time uh, in this particular place. I have also I have to say that I have been working in Leticia, which is in the extreme south of Colombia, which is an area that is half rural and still half um, the forest, I would say. And the indigenous communities who live there, among them the Muinamurui community with who, uh, and Cristobal's community, um, are communities who came there after a very long history of violence, genocide and expropriation uh, related to rubber plantations. And so the communities living nearby Leticia live in this um, in-betweenness between the forest and the city. So it's not, I think that it's, um, it's um, there are forms of indigeneity that are different today and it's, it's um, 
you know, the, the Muina Murui community has installed in this particular place after a very long exile, as I said, related to violence. So for me, there was not, there, there is no sense in going to impose my presence in the community because they have their own autonom autonomy and sovereignty. So it's more about how I am able to build a, con a relationship with Cristobal as a person and how we can uh, engage in a dialogue and maybe I, I, we can have a form of reciprocity. So I think my methodology is not to go live into uh, an indigenous community, but more to engage with individuals as persons, I, as I would engage with an actor living in France or anywhere else. And I do know Lothar Baumgarten's work, which I found very interesting. I am perhaps a little bit more distant with his work now because, uh, as I said, I have a little bit of distance with... Um, um, yes, I, I'm not... I think that what I'm... If there's an aspect of his work that I like the most, it would be the, the curiosity that he had to be able to um, engage a conversation and, and, and engage his existence with uh, such, a culture, such an extreme cultural difference. And so I think that this is a very interesting, interesting um, element of his work, the capacity of, of being able to relate with people who are extremely different than we are and, and living in very different places and, and conditions. And the form of curiosity and attention to the ecology that I are extremely important. Right now, I don't feel that close to his work because I feel my methodology, as I said, is different. Also, I am not an European going to the Amazon myself, but I'm more, I'm a mestiza. So I am from Colombia. And even though I come from the, uh, from Bogota, which is the capital of the country, and when I go to the Amazon, there are different power structures at stake. Um, the, I would say that the, what's going on in indigenous communities is part of my own story. It's the story of my country. So I feel that I'm speaking from a place that is rather different, rather, that is different and, and specific. I had a question about um, how did your French and Colombian heritage and culture impact um, your films? Well, yes, there's a sense of um, in-betweenness that is very present in my work in many different aspects. The fact that the work is in between arts and between cinema, the fact that I produce them half in Colombia and half in France, uh, the fundings that I have for the films are also uh, in between the countries. So I guess the, this form of um, plurality in the culture is something that is also um, present in the films. So I can, for example, uh, be very interested and even obsessed by specific local stories related to Colombian history, but and then have the real extreme privilege of being able to take a little bit of distance and, um, and, and have other way, other forms of language that come from other parts and other cultures, and to be able to uh, infuse that into into my films, 